Well, thank you, Mary, and it's great to get a round of applause before I start speaking, <laughs> just in case I don't get one at the end. And again, thank you all very much for coming on this pretty awful day outside. I want to speak about a vision for Jersey and why I think Jersey politics needs to change in order to achieve that vision. Now, everybody's got to have a vision. If you're an individual, an organisation, a business, you need to understand what it is you're actually trying to do. Because if you don't understand that, you're not going to be successful. Now, arguably, nations are rather different. You might be hard-pressed to say what sort of vision is Britain aspiring to at present. Now, Jersey's a nation, but it's a small nation. It can't be all things to all people. Rather, like any business, it's got to decide the areas it wants to specialise in and whether it's content with what might be called a quiet life, or rather, whether it wants to be ambitious. Now, you can't create a vision out of thin air. A vision has to take account of the past and what is practically achievable. I, mean, I had a vision of being a world-class golfer. I quickly gave that one up, because clearly I do not have the capability. But Jersey's past can quite simply be summed up as a highly successful island community that's punched way above its weight, including in the international arena. For a community of just over 100,000 people, it has a name recognition and a deserved reputation, which are probably unrivaled. The scope for lengthy debate about how Jersey has been so successful, but I would sum it up in just two things. First of all, Jersey's special relationship with the United Kingdom, and secondly, the entrepreneurial skill of generations of Jersey people who have seized the opportunities open to them and made a success of them. So what's the right vision for Jersey? Well, we can all agree on a few things. It is a very special island with its own unique characteristics and a strong personality of which we can all be proud. It is a diverse, eclectic, vibrant, enterprising community that enjoys family life and simple pleasures in a beautiful environment. But such a statement of things as they are today is not a vision. We in the Jersey Alliance have done our homework. We've talked to people, we've read all of the available research, and we've conducted our own research. So our vision for the island reflects what we think of the people's vision. Jersey should be a vibrant and dynamic community. And it's right to use the word community here, not economy. A highly successful economy in terms of economic output, but at the expense of the well-being of the community that creates that wealth is a wholly unattractive proposition. There are four key elements of our vision. A high quality education system that equips our young people to succeed in a rapidly changing world of work. An economy that continually adapts, now with an increasing focus on technology. A first class healthcare system that covers everything from prevention to long term care and a society that strives to reduce inequality and help ensure equality of opportunity. I want to expand on these areas. Well, first of all, education, very dear to my heart. I started my career 50-something <coughs> years ago as a school teacher. Um, I retired as a school teacher at the age of 23. <laughs> and my last significant role in London was as chairman of the governors of an uh, inner London state comprehensive from which I learned a lot more than I gave. The future prosperity and nature of Jersey depends on the quality of the whole of its education system. It's also a key to limiting population growth and that the more that local people can do the jobs that we need in the island, the less the need for workers from elsewhere. I'd like to think that the education outcomes in Jersey are good but it's difficult to find hard evidence on that. What evidence there is is that generally they're okay, but are not up to the standard that the island is entitled to expect. And in a few respects, they're poor. However, they have certainly improved markedly in the last few years. It will be a priority to improve educational outcomes. And a prerequisite for this is to identify how well Jersey schools are doing in relation to comparable jurisdictions in England, and indeed in the world. Our young people are going to compete in a global marketplace, and we owe it to them to ensure that they are equipped to do so. 
Our population policy in this respect needs to meet the needs of education, not the other way around. And the necessary funding has to be made available. I commend the Government for commissioning two excellent reports on funding of education and inclusive education. The commissioning excellent reports and even agreeing them in principle is the easy part. The recommendations need to be implemented with urgency. Further education tends to be the poor relation in the UK and in Jersey. Priority is given to schools and universities. But further education is vital to the success of the Jersey economy and therefore to the prosperity of islanders. There is a need for vocational courses, a need, a need for an adult skills programme given the necessity now in a rapidly changing economy for lifelong learning. Highlands College currently provides a good range of vocational courses, but its campus is simply not fit for purpose and a long way from what is required to serve Jersey's economy. There are plans to improve the facilities, but they seem to have stalled. The development of a new campus, not just for Highlands, but for higher education, is essential. Now, in higher education, most Jersey students go to the UK, and that's appropriate. But we do need to expand provision on Ireland, particularly for those people for whom it's not practical to go to the UK. And we need to meet the needs of local business. There's actually quite a good offering from a number of institutions in Jersey. But we should be more ambitious. It should be possible to attract a leading university to establish a specialist centre in the island in a subject relevant to Jersey, sustainability, island studies, even technology. And that would attract students from outside Jersey to spend time in the island. Such a centre would help to put Jersey on the map in respect of higher education and could enhance its reputation in a number of areas in which Jersey has some expertise. And as one of my colleagues said, the students can help in the <coughs> hospitality industry as well. So on to the economy. While economic prosperity is not everything, it is important. Many Jersey families, indeed probably all Jersey families, are currently having to face rising prices. <coughs> prices rising more rapidly than incomes. And a significant proportion are struggling to make ends meet. Now, there's no simple solution of the government subsidising the cost of particular goods or services, or lowering taxes or increasing benefits. The government has no independent source of funds. Every penny it spends has to be raised from the people of Jersey. Economic prosperity depends on Jersey's economy, on the ability of the people in Jersey to make and sell goods and services that people outside Jersey want to buy. Now, some in Jersey may not like this, but the reality is that the prosperity of the island currently depends to a large extent on finance centre activity. In round terms, this accounts for 30% of employment, 40% of economic output, and 70% of tax revenue. So those who think we can do without the finance industry need to understand the consequences. It would mean a huge reduction in the standard of living. In the foreseeable future, finance centre activities will continue to be very important to the Jersey economy, and we must do what we can to maintain that. But the success of the industry can't be taken for granted. It needs to adapt to changing circumstances, and the island does need to develop other industries so as to diversify the economy. We had a good look at what might be done for the economy, and we read the excellent report called New Perspectives by Independent Members of Jersey's Economic Council. Um, we don't mind borrowing from others. We'll pinch anybody's policies if we agree with them. We're not into reinventing the wheel. There's far too much of that. So we simply adopt the recommendations in that report as a basis for our policy on the economy. There were five integrated strategic themes that came out in that report. Jersey needs to stimulate growth by encouraging a more vibrant entrepreneurial culture and enhancing local innovation. Sustainability is a huge force in shaping society, and Jersey needs to place that at the centre of economic policy. Jersey must embrace the importance of the new economy being created globally through technology, artificial intelligence and data. The island needs regeneration from an infrastructure and quality of life perspective. And finally, I come back to education. 
and S Jersey innovates and aspires to the highest levels in education and skills development across our entire population, our economy will not be possible. And on to healthcare. Very convenient. <laughs> in respect of healthcare, the main talking point may be the hospital. But there are other issues that need to be addressed now. Jersey is a prosperous economy, and the people of Jersey are entitled to affordable first-class health care, most <coughs> provided on island, but some off-island. But there's a wealth of evidence, well documented by the government, that Jersey is some way off meeting the first-class test, particularly in respect of mental health and community care. The Jersey care model is right as a model. But if models are not built properly, they don't work. <coughs> and the model is not currently working as it should. Now, the existing arrangements must be made to work rather better, more efficiently. And that simply requires effective management with strong political oversight. There may be needs, a need to change in some particular areas. I've been impressed with the work that charities do. They have first-hand experience of some of the big issues. But I don't think full use of being made of that resource, whether it's in respect of what they do or their views. And they need funding for the medium term. Charities can't run on a one-year basis. If that happens, then the chief executive spends his or her time chasing money, not getting on with the job. And finally, equality of opportunity. We believe as a party in a society that strives to reduce inequality and help ensure equality of opportunity. Now, in the short term, this is partly achieved in Jersey by a very high income tax threshold and welfare benefits. But in the long term, we need policies that help reduce the need for tax and spend policies. I'm going to mention housing here. The problem in Jersey, as you all know, is one of affordability. It's not unique to Jersey. It is a problem that is shared in many other parts of the world, in London, in Auckland, Indeed, many other cities you can find exactly the same debate. The problem is partly a consequence of global developments, low interest rates, and partly a consequence of government policy, which in Jersey, as elsewhere, has constrained the supply of housing with the result that rising demand has led to higher prices. Very basic economics. The solution is not to control prices and to deal only with the symptoms, but rather to tackle the causes. And this must mean more housing and a planning system that's geared to provide more housing. I'm going to draw on the words of Paul Martin, the outgoing chief executive, who did a great job for Jersey. He said, we need to see housing issues first through the experience of those who do not own their own homes and struggle to maintain a roof over their heads, especially where children live in a family unit. I'm sure the Jersey spirit means that most people would go along with this. Now, currently, the footprint of housing is actually comparatively small, and there really should be no great difficulty in substantially increasing the housing stock without altering our beautiful environment. We've had numerous reports and many ministers, and some good progress has been made, but the planning and other constraints on the supply of housing must be tackled urgently, because the high cost of housing is not just a problem for young Jersey families but also for businesses that find it difficult to recruit, and indeed for the health, education and other public services. In the last few days, I'm aware of meetings being cancelled because of shortage of staff. And we see some of our restaurants and cafes now with limited opening hours. Now, it won't be easy to move away from where we are with very high house prices. We certainly don't want a sharp fall in house prices. That would go down very badly with the people in this room, who I suspect have been the beneficiaries of high house prices on the whole. But in the short term, we therefore need a big expansion in the supply of social rented housing and schemes to help first-time buyers, particularly with the deposit. Now, housing is not the only issue relevant to equality of opportunity. I return to education, because that is vital. I was involved in education in London, and I remember sitting next to the head of an academy the City of London had set up, and it had done a brilliant job. And I said to him, what would happen to these kids that we're now seeing leaving the school, going to good universities, if it hadn't been for the school? He said half of them would be in prison. 
and that probably was an understatement. That is what good education can do. So education is vital. Children from disadvantaged backgrounds start behind their peers in terms of attainment. 80% of the difference in GCE results between rich and poor children has been determined by the age of seven. And a lot of it has been determined by the age of four. We must close that gap. It means better early years education. And it also means that the primary schools in town must have the resources they need to address their particular challenges. High proportion of children whose English is not first language and from disadvantaged backgrounds. So that's a bit about the vision, but why do we need politics to change? What's wrong with the present system? Now, I've been involved in politics in various forms in Jersey and the UK for many, many years since I was first the milk monitor at the age of seven at St. Martin's School. The one thing I learned is that deciding on the right thing to do is the easy bit. Doing it is difficult. Prominent European politician said, we know exactly what we should be doing, but we can't work out how to be re-elected when we've done it. So politics is the art of getting things done. So I think most people would go along with what I've said on education, the economy, healthcare, housing, and promoting equality of opportunity. There were problems in Jersey here because of a failure of governance. And I stress governance, not government. I'm not pointing the finger at individuals, there's far too much of that in Jersey. And I firmly believe the majority of ministers over many years have done their very best for the island and have been subject to much unfair criticism and indeed completely unacceptable abuse. What's wrong with our political system is that it makes it very difficult to take decisions. And even when decisions are taken, they can be untaken and reviewed. The real scandal with the hospital is that the State's Assembly decided in 2012 that it needed to be replaced by 2020. And here we are in 2022 with still much uncertainty. Now traditionally the Jersey political system operated with individuals being elected and the committee system. And it worked well when the issues were simpler and when there were political giants like Cyril Amarco, Ralph Vibert and officials like Colin Powell. But the nature of politics has changed. In Jersey and elsewhere, it's become more nasty, more adversarial, and less evidence-based. It is really not acceptable for politicians to be expected to give instant answers on major complex issues without the opportunity to study any evidence. But even worse when politicians actually do so. So what's happened in recent elections is that after the people have elected their candidates, the state's members get together and elect a chief minister who nominates ministers, and then they begin thinking about what to do. The public has no say on this. At least with senators, people could express a view for the politicians they most prefer, who would then have a reasonable chance of occupying the top jobs. That option's gone. That's why we need political parties, setting out very clearly before an election what they would do in government and the team that would be doing it. Now, the Jersey Alliance has not hesitated to publish a number of policy papers, housing, education, healthcare, the economy, others to come on population, machinery of government, environment and culture. And the serial critics in the island have duly delivered their criticism, but in most cases without having a constructive word to say about what they would do. We've also built a team of highly capable people from diverse backgrounds committed to working together something that does not exist in the state's assembly today, but which is crucial to having an efficient government. You follow your particular sports, football, rugby or cricket, you can't have an individual deciding to do their own thing. The team's decided to play defensively, you don't want somebody doing the opposite. If you need to chase 100 runs in 15 overs, you don't want Jeff Boycott batting for his average. <laughs> and it's exactly the same in the government. You need a team of people because the decisions are complex and involve more than one area. So the Jersey electorate has a choice at the election. They can vote for independent candidates, but quite possibly the winning candidates will be less able to play a role in government. Or they can vote for one of four parties, though whether they'll be for the election remains to be seen. Now I would urge people to find the candidate or the parties that most accord with their views and to vote accordingly. There is too much personality politics in Jersey. 
I hear people say, and I've heard it today, we will vote for your party or we would except for the fact that so-and-so is a member. Or even that so-and-so's grandfather jilted my grandmother. <laughs> now, I don't think that's really the right way to go about things. We do have to have a government in Jersey. And if people choose not to vote, then they can't really complain if the government is not to their liking. But the Jersey Alliance is committed to making the system work better. We are committed to reducing the appalling time-wasting in the state's assembly and how nice it is to see a couple of people here today. Where some members speak at great length without adding anything to a debate, a skill which I have no wish to aspire to. Decisions constantly being reviewed and the continued search to find somebody to blame. There is a terrible blame culture within the civil service. And if there's a blame culture, you know the best way to avoid blame? Don't take a decision. Commissioner review. Defer the decision. Get PwC to review what we've done. Employ more consultants. Officers are often tied up in reviews, responding to reviews, responding to yet more requests for information from assembly members, rather than getting on with the job. Politics can be unpleasant, and in Jersey it is. I want to make it less unpleasant. The Alliance Party is committed to fighting a positive campaign, setting out its policies and not simply attacking others. We have no intention of attacking others. And we won't engage in personal abuse, of which there is no need, and which is not in line with how we like to live in Jersey. The people of Jersey are stunningly efficient in their personal lives and in business, and stunningly inefficient in respect of their government. What Jersey needs is a government elected by the people, that is the team who will form the Council of Ministers and with policies clearly set out in advance in the manifesto. This is an important election for Jersey. I want people to be engaged, to look at the candidates, look at what they're saying, look at what the parties are saying and to vote for their preferred candidates. It will be very clear what and who the Jersey Alliance will be offering. What I would say to you and to any other audience that I'm speaking to, I ask for nothing more than you consider what we have to say and who we are and that you make up your own minds. Thank you.